My name is uh, James Westfall. I work for NEAT, uh, and uh, we make uh, audio visual equipment. I also see a lot of uh, former colleagues uh, from uh, Tumra and Zivid, and uh, it's wonderful to have uh, people I know in the room, but it also might be better if it was just a room of absolute perfect strangers. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the uh, art of uh, living with broken things. Um, I'll start with a disclaimer. Um, sometimes this kind of talk will uh, sound like uh, I am saying that you have to be doing what we are doing because I might be a little bit eager perhaps, but uh, actually that's not the case. There's no right or wrong, but uh, I'd like to show you how we uh, at NEAT and the uh, auto test uh, department are trying to live with broken tests, basically broken end-to-end -end tests, and show you the thinking behind that. And my hope is that this will be applicable to you. Um, to that end, I'd like to conduct a short survey, which I've done, I've presented here three years now. This is the third time. So same survey, but I've, I've learned uh, that I need to add a couple extra questions. Um, so do you develop, identify as a developer? Raise your hand. Do you identify as a tester? Cool, we actually got testers. That's new this year. <laughs> uh, do you identify as both? I, oh, wow, that's great. And that's, that's, that's where I am, by the way. Uh, next question, which I've learned I should ask. Do you write end-to-end -end tests? Yes. Okay, and I suppose uh, those who don't have their hands up are answering no, and ha! which is Norwegian for, please tell me what end-to-end -end tests are. I won't give you a full definition, but I will tell you how we do it. At NEAT, um, we are testing uh, embedded software. So we're testing custom software that includes an operating system and custom drivers for our video conferencing devices. And they are, and this is kind of the end-to-end -end part of it, deployed on real custom hardware uh, targets, so video conference uh, devices. Um, and very often we have a lot of very cool test instrumentation uh, activated. I like to tell my wife's kids that, uh, yeah, I my job is giving our video conference devices bad dreams. I can make them see things that aren't there, for example. And yeah, I had a nice job earlier at uh, Tumra, so a lot of Tumra people here, and there was fun ways to make the uh, uh, reverse vending machine also see objects, uh, bottles that weren't there and uh, things passing on conveyor belts when there was nothing there. So, yeah. Uh, so, yes. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about me. Um, I have worked as a software developer and I was talking about this with some former Tumblr colleagues before. Uh, so, <laughs> a legitimate software developer with uh, quite a bit of responsibility since, so, not when I started in 2001, but over the years. Um, but have had a, I would say, perhaps unhealthy level of interest in autotest uh, since 2008. And uh, for the first time in my life, my last two professional roles have had test in them. So now I am a senior test engineer at NEAT. Um, a tester, how do you identify a tester? It's, it's right, the universal system for a tester is you have a spanner in your hand. And generally speaking, that, that's, that's not realistic. When I worked at Tumbra, it was realistic. I had a spanner, and it was very, very uh, necessary for <laughs> um, tearing the machines apart and putting them together and doing that. Um, another little thing. Um, my wife is Swedish, and uh, she calls me a test Nisa. You have to understand that there are a few things that aren't quite the same in Swedish as in Norwegian. Uh, in Norwegian, as anyone who's not a Norwegian speaker, I'll fill you in, Nisse means idiot. Whereas I think the most correct translation for Nisse in Swedish is dude. So I guess all Norwegians are very happy that, to know that every Swede is a Nisse. Uh, so let's get started. Um, so this is my lead-in claim. Um, the failure pos policy for end-to-end -end tests is different from that of unit tests. I will claim that if you have a failing unit test, you have a problem, right? So there's something you need to fairly immediately fix. 
um, because that test should be very, very close to the implementation. It should mean that if it's failing, there's something wrong. Um, but in the end-to-end -end test world, failing tests, or even, God forbid, flaky tests, aren't necessarily a problem. And I will say even that the dream of a perfect night's test run may actually be harmful because if you have that, if you want that, you might not be writing the tests you should be writing that are targeting the weaknesses in your system. And you may say, my system has no weaknesses. I see people smiling, so okay. Um, my, my idea is I don't want to work in a company without, uh, in a, that has systems without weaknesses because those have to be incredibly boring and simple systems and it wouldn't be very interesting to test them. Um, still, there's a lot of people dreaming about the green day, not the band, <laughs> but the green day, uh, the day when all tests uh, run green. Um, or maybe they're uh, at least dreaming of the day when you get consistent tests. Same tests are always failing, the same tests are always passing. I'll note in passing here, this is a picture of George Boole, the, the father of Boolean logic. Very nice that we have him in black and white. Um, does anybody know the story, the story of George Boole's death? Well, let me fill you in on that one. Uh, he was teaching in a university, I guess it was in Scotland. Uh, came home from lecture on a rainy day, got wet, uh, caught a cold. Um, his wife said, well, you know, uh, you've got a cold, um, so we need to wrap you in wet blankets to cure your cold. So there was a very perverse, negating the negative, Boolean logic uh, in, uh, in, in, behind this uh, attempt. Uh, you can't just blame his wife because, you know, obviously it rang a bell in his world. Uh, he went along with it and died. So I'm just trying to come with the claim that even flaky tests might actually not be a bad thing. It might actually be something you want. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, test failures we really want. And um, we want tests that are passing, uh, and they're passing because they should be passing. So true passing. Uh, flip things around in the test world, right? So you see things backwards and you say true negative, right? So it's in the negative, the test hasn't found an issue. So true negative. Um, we, this is my claim. This is maybe a little bit of a newer claim. Uh, this is maybe the point of my talk or one of the big points. We really do want true positive, uh, true failing. We want our tests to fail when there actually is a problem. And this is highly desirable. You might be dreaming about the green day, but you have to give up on that dream. Okay, um, the things we don't want are uh, false positive. Very often, yeah, yeah, that test failed, but it's a problem with the test. Uh, so we'll be talking a good bit about test reliability, how we can keep away from this. And I think the even worst one is the false negative when you have a passing test, but it really should be falling. Failing, you have a test that's not catching uh, the issue that it's meant to catch. Um, yeah. But it's really not easy, this here. Um, there's a big problem with test failures. Um, test runs, test jobs can lose value really, really fast because you can't see the, the signal uh, from all the noise of test failures. Eventually you come to and say, this is just a wash. There's kind of a you run into a risk of an exponential loss of test failure, of, of value from your end-to-end -end tests for a linear increase in the number of failures. And the thing which I really would like to <laughs> make sure that everyone wants to focus on with the end-to-end -end tests you're writing is delivering value. And I would go back and say the value is basically this. It's going to be telling you at every given point uh, where the problems are in your system and hopefully also, also as well where things are working correctly and even maybe where the weaknesses are if we have flaky tests. Um, but there's a bit of a 
scaling problem with auto tests. So we want to deliver value. We're not just writing tests because, oh, we, we should be writing tests, right? Uh, please don't. Um, there was Jurgen uh, Kowalswick talked about fireable offenses in his last talk. That's <laughs> maybe one. Um, but uh, here's the big problem. If you have enough end-to-end -end tests to actually be delivering value, to be regularly catching regressions that are pushed in domain since yesterday, you also necessarily have a scaling problem, which means that uh, there can be so much noise or knock-on failures from other failing tests that you lose all the value you, you have, right? So that's kind of the, the conundrum of if you, if you have an effective test, end-to-end -end test regime, you have problems dealing with it. So that's what I want to kind of focus on. How do we crack that difficult nut? And um, I, I heard about this uh, art of uh, Japanese art. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, where you break a bowl and then you sort of use some silver or gold or something and paste it back together. And I thought this really resonated, this, this thing called kintsugi, with, uh, with what I'm thinking about tests, that we should say that breakage and repair are actually welcome when they're breakage and repair that aren't, that are meaningful when they're true, true, uh, are, they, they are a part of the history of our test objects should be welcome, should be even celebrated rather than something to disguise. So that's, that's kind of what, uh, yeah, this, this art, I want to talk about how we uh, at uh, NEAT have tried to cultivate this art. And so it's not, uh, it's not, not easy, but there's a big payoff here. Right? And I've alluded this before. Tests that are failing, failing every night, are giving you an always up-to-date status of the problems in your system. Um, happens quite frequently that we have uh, tests that have been failing, 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 and suddenly they stop failing and we go in and uh, we investigate and, uh, ooh, somebody fixed it. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise your hands because I know the answer. Do you know everything that's happening in your code base? Do you know all the fixes that are being integrated into your code base? You don't. I talked last year about a concept, a simple concept called situational awareness, and tests contribute to building that situational awareness. And here's another follow-up claim. Flaky tests, the absolute worst kind of tests maybe, but they do have value because they are providing input to your stretched teams, showing them sort of on a daily basis with concrete ev evidence where the pain points lie. And you don't like to admit it, but we have several pain points, so we have to prioritize them and figure out which one we're going to devote our efforts to. And uh, we can take this to the deciders and say, you know, look, I think we need to fix this. I think this shows this is causing pain out in our, our user world. And usually they go and sort of check with the uh, support people and get the confirmation. And then we even get the allocation of resources to make that test go green. And you sort of feel like, oh, I'm actually useful. <laughs> um, so, well, the real challenge perhaps is, um, it wouldn't be so difficult maybe if tests were generally always red or always green. Uh, the nasty one are the, are the, um, are the flaky ones. So um, we've, uh, yeah, tried to address this. I've been working on this for a while. Um, so I, I thought I'd take you along in the journey and uh, tell you what, what we've tried. Um, I'm actually gonna talk about things that have kinda worked but not entirely worked, and I think that's very, very, very useful. There's this bias when you have uh, academic uh, uh, journal articles that people only present the successes. Right, but there's so much to learn from the things that didn't necessarily work 100% like we had wished. Um, but uh, I'll take you for a ride here, if it's okay. Um, so this represents a first attempt uh, a couple years ago, in fact, where, um, yeah, we've got a couple types of end-to-end -end tests. Uh, these were some robot tests, uh, kind of like Python behave. I'm gonna give you a quick demonstration of both robot and Python behave because I think I will claim you should be using an end-to-end -end test framework for end-to-end -end tests, and we'll try to convince you. Um, 
But we used a tool called ElastAlert. So we're using um, ElasticStack, and ElastAlert uh, is, a, is a tool that uh, has some cool possibilities. And one of the things you could do is you can set up basically a rule that's going to be running every 24 hours uh, that's going to give you a diff of test failures from the previous day. And we get it in Slack. That's okay. It's a step, right? It's trying to, you know, we're trying to, trying to figure out what's going on. We're trying to figure out the trends. We're trying to separate the signal from the noise. But um, let me ask you a question. How many chances with uh, the Elast Alert, just a diff of past and passes and failures from 24 hours ago to the latest test run, how many chances do you get to catch each one of these two very significant trends, which are regressions and corrections? How many chances do you get to see that, notice that? I see someone with a finger. You get one chance. So this was probably actually more harmful than good, right? We see tests churn, right, flaky tests, but it, it doesn't identify, probably which is the, I think you will agree, these are the two most important trends we want to pick out. It obscures them. So we had to keep going. Um, so, well, okay. We thought, yeah, this is, um, this is a, a little bit of an improvement here. And so this is a Kibana dashboard. And I talked a bit about uh, dashboards last year, but using timelines. And uh, um, so here we have a, some correlated metrics. We have uh, test results for in 24 hour chunks. And then over that, we have uh, pipelines. And uh, we have uh, five pipelines, or five, five jobs in a pipeline, basically. So five jobs, yeah, one pipeline, but five jobs that are contributing to uh, this. Uh, this 24 hour total. So we basically were running at one time a day. So we basically know that this pipeline ID with these five jobs, with these trend lines, make up this here. So in this way, we can actually see at least uh, if uh, the totals are going up or down over time, that has value. And we can also home in on, we've broken these up into more manageable chunks by breaking them up into smaller jobs, just so it would be easier. So we can see, oh, suddenly, right, okay, here was a, here was a significant dip on this job here. I fixed it so that we see the label better now. But then I could go in and try and figure out what happened there. So I'm starting at least to um, be able to see things trend-wise that are useful that I can act upon. And I can go in and see, is this a problem with the target system, the system under test, or is this just a problem with the test? Um, so we're getting there. But let me ask you a question. Are we still missing something here? And yes, we are. We're basically only doing bulk tracing. We're not tracking individual test results. So what does this mean? It means that tests, individual tests, can be trading red and green status every day. So super flaky, but just as long as the totals are the same, we wouldn't notice it, right? So it's when you're working with these kind of dashboard things, when you're looking for trends, it's always really, really good to ask yourself, OK, yeah, this, this helps, but what am I missing? What's missing from the picture? What might even be misleading, All right? Um, so um, yeah. Uh, so then we, we came up with an idea. Um, it wasn't, uh, I stumbled upon a, uh, a master's thesis, in fact, I'll present to the author. But uh, uh, we thought, well, okay, let's start focusing on individual test results. Uh, this was at peak uh, machine learning hype uh, period, right? Uh, so I sort of felt, okay, if we're not jumping on that train now, I, we're, 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 we're not any good. Uh, so, but nevertheless, uh, we're going to, use a machine learning model to uh, determine, to classify each test execution and when that text execution, so each failing text execution, and store that uh, 
label or that tag uh, as an attribute of each failure. So suddenly we're looking at test failures individually rather than looking at bulk aggregates. Uh, this is uh, what, uh, what it looks like here. Uh, this is our scrub view. We have a really good tool maker in our team whose name is Nikolai, who's sitting here in the audience. And uh, so uh, this is what we do to look at end-to-end -end test failures uh, every day. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, we can comment it, uh, and uh, we can also see perhaps it's a known issue and just connect it to a JIRA case, for example. So very, very nice for seeing clearly. But one thing it's doing is we have the machine learning model here, which is looking at uh, each test failure and giving it a category. We've built up a taxonomy of different failure types, and the machine learning model is assigning it. And in this nice GUI that Nikolai has made, if we decide that, no, that was, uh, the model got it wrong, then we can override it, and you'll see how that input is used. And it works as a bit of a mental handle, actually, uh, for uh, when we come to this scrub view, we have a rotating weekly basis, who gets to be the scrubber, uh, and so it, it helps a little bit, actually. And I can tell you a little bit uh, about the details of uh, how this is implemented. Uh, first, the inspiration, it was a guy in uh, Lund, University, um, who wrote this uh, master's thesis about uh, clustering. We didn't really focus so much on clustering, but classifying uh, test failures using machine learning. Um, the, uh, how does this work for us? All of our data is stored in Elasticstack. We have a quite high degree of normalization, very specialized fields in our JSON for all kinds of different things related to uh, tests, uh, test failures, uh, everything about tests. We denormalize that by building up a single document with all the relevant, or what we think is the relevant data for classifying a failure. Um, we turn that document into what's in machine learning is called features using the uh, TFIDF, uh, um, yeah, sort of it's a statistical method that's looking at word frequencies. And then uh, we train up a text recognition model to tag uh, individual documents based on that. Um, this is what the data looks like a bit. This is what the document looks like. It's not going to be readable from this distance. But you can see we've got uh, a bunch of everything bar sort of built up in an individual document. And then we train up the model by giving it the right category for the failure in the taxonomy that we've defined uh, that fits our needs. Um, we used a scikit-learn, a uh, really incredibly cool uh, machine learning um, uh, Python framework. Uh, Spotify uses it to figure out what uh, you want to listen, and I think they do a good job with that. Uh, it's really nice to come to the machine learning world late. Uh, scikit-learn is very, very mature. Uh, you can just define a pipeline and, for example, you can algorithm shop. I sort of thought, okay, this sounds like identifying spam. Uh, so uh, Bayes, Bayesian filters are often used for spam, so I thought naive Bayes would be the way to go. But a sort of really dodgy quick round of algorithm shopping, which was like a one-liner to change, to say, no, no let's, let's run it through random forest, gave massively superior results. Frighteningly superior results. This is what's called a confusion matrix. Uh, so you can just run this in Jupyter and uh, uh, run through your, uh, your test data. So basically train it up on tag data and then ask it to classify that tag data without looking at the, the labels. And you see, Basically, this is a matrix. X is the true label. Y is the predicted label. And you see there is an incredibly regular 40 diagonal uh, line right here. There is one failure it mixed up uh, in two cases of the data we trained it up on, uh, the label. And they were actually fairly close labels, hard to distinguish. So maybe we should have worked on the taxonomy. But uh, so frighteningly good results. and. Um, uh, well, um, that, uh, that is a step on the way, actually, uh, using this uh, to getting to where we want to go. Because we can basically say that certain types of failures will, generally speaking, land on um, uh, specific sides of this diagram. So uh, an assertion failure, uh, occasionally an assertion failure goes wrong but it's quite rare, in fact. 
right? Assertion failures are generally true failing, so a true positive. Uh, runtime error, all right? The code, uh, there's, it just didn't work. It, uh, <laughs> who knows what? Uh, uh, that's generally a uh, false positive. That's generally a, uh, yeah, a test uh, that should not be failing. Um, maintenance of this, um, as I mentioned, the squeaks scrubber chooses the correct category for the mislabeled. We have some metrics on this. Uh, this is a fairly subjective thing here, but we're well over to determine what category we should use for a given test failure, but we're well over 90%, even though it's fairly subjective. So it works incredibly well, in fact. Um, and we retrain daily on uh, uh, a few hundred uh, lines of uh, CSV sort of seed data, and then all human overridden category choices since January 2023. Um, last time I checked, this process took 61 seconds. So, you know, in the world of I've started downloading LMM, LLM models to my machine and generally speaking always stopped for, because I realized I was running out of resources. This is a very, very lightweight and a very well-performing uh, setup, actually. Um, but let's do what uh, I have suggested and uh, ask ourselves, what do we still not know? So we may actually know why a test is failing, but we actually don't know how often it's failing. Um, so um, we can pull up that information, right? We can pull up these nice timelines. They are very, very useful. But I will present the idea that actually having this as an own attribute, the trend of a test, is a very, very powerful thing. Um, so just like we're tagging with the failure category, now we're going to tag individual test executions uh, with uh, their trend, and we'll also attach to it uh, a graphic uh, red-green timeline bar, so it's very visual and easy to follow. Let's see what this gets us. Um, well, the first thing we have to do is we have to actually define what the trends are. Um, so this is pure logic. Um, easy one, uh, consistently passing, consistently failing. So either always green, always red. Um, next up, more difficult, intermittently failing. Um, so it's, uh, it's intermittently failing. It's mostly green. It's deep in the green territory but it fails once in a while. Intermittently passing, the inverse. Deep in the red territory, but occasionally runs green. Flaky, flaky now is not just an indiscriminate word for we don't really know. Flaky is defined as what is in the middle of these two here. And then two sort of meta trends which are really important, which are regression when we go from green to red, green, red, and from red, green. Okay, and how do we, how do we calculate this? Well, um, uh, use some uh, functional inspired programming, basically um, do this uh, functionally and procedurally. We have defined uh, some functions that have only one job and they try to do it well to define one trend and we go through them in a specific order, so the procedural paradigm and when it finds the trend, then it just stops and says, yep, that's the trend. Um, we've tried to test this. I would love it if uh, Jürgen Kvalsvik could give me a formal way to prove that we, given any sequence of Boolean values, that we always pull out a trend. Um, haven't formally proved it, uh, but uh, there's a nice uh, library called Intertools, which uh, can basically just give you um, permutations. Uh, so uh, I've asked it to generate for me uh, every set of Boolean values with from zero to 10 members. Uh, so 10 members is two to the 10th. Uh, values, right? So 1,024. So the test runs incredibly quickly. It runs just, uh, you know, a couple hundred milliseconds. And with that, we've at least said, okay, we've empirically shown that this uh, does actually always give us trend. How does this look? Well, this is the, when we're looking at our Kibana 
dashboard, we can see how these patterns are represented graphically. So we get the trend, and this is for an individual text ex test execution. We have a correction, which we love, red, red, red. This is actually the sample size. It's trying to take, it takes all the runs for that test for that job. So it's some, we're using these end-to-end -end tests and we're reusing them very often because reusing code is good, right? Uh, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but so it's, so it's per test, per job, last 30 days. So I just wrote the sample size so it would be readable. Um, so correction, consistently passing, intermittently failing, right? Sort of the worst kind of flaky, the one that once in a while, is there a reason for that? Is there something with first uh, day of the month or who knows what? Flaky, uh, fantastic uh, representation of flaky. Intermittently passing, that might even be a little bit, even just about as heartbreaking as intermittently failing. Yeah, once in a while. Uh, regression, regression doesn't have to look like this. Generally speaking, it's just green, 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 red, 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 but that's also regression where it basically is, uh, has gone through a flaky stage and consistently failing. Um, so uh, here's, uh, here's our dashboard. Uh, we have 619 uh, behave feature runs uh, when I took this screenshot. So we are at the scale that produces value, but we do also necessarily have massive problems seen clearly. I have claimed that that is the conundrum of auto-testing efforts. If you have enough tests to be effective, you also have big problems seeing what's going on. We can see a little bit, we've got all the tags uh, for all the different things we're testing. Uh, also, yeah, last seven days, we got the, what, uh, what the most uh, common uh, reasons why the tests are failing from the machine learning mod model. But um, from here, it's a little bit hard to say, to figure out what should I actually focus on. So what we have created is uh, what I like to call the trouble view. And the trouble view has a filter on it, and we can also produce other views, but it has a filter on it for flaky, intermittently passing, stabilizing, failing, and regression trends. So this is very interesting. You don't have to hunt down the trouble points by executing a lot of different queries. The trouble points come to you and say, this is, this is the, Houston, here we have problems. Um, and this is incredibly valuable for knowing what to do, where to focus your energies uh, to yeah, see if uh, uh, there are new problems that have appeared in the software or if you have flaky tests that need to be um, changed or to see the scale of a known problem. Um, let me tell you what I think this is doing. Uh, and this uh, goes back to another life I had a very long time ago. I used to live in a place that had uh, good surfing possibilities and you had um, long period swell that would come and that's what you were interested in as a surfer, uh, big waves, but pretty much every day after 10 or 11 in the morning, the, uh, the wind, the sea breeze would come and that would create a lot of short period waves, what's called chop, right? And what I am claiming here is this setup allows us to see sometimes the very long period trends through the chop of failing tests, right? A long period means that the cycle is very, very long from passing to failing to flaky to very, very long trend. And you want to be able to read that trend through the, through the chop, which is kind of obscuring that, which is basically the chop is noise. Um, so that's what I think uh, the value that this delivers is. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how uh, we found that it's uh, useful, uh, what's useful to do to actually get the value out of that. And that is actually wait. When you are working with end-to-end -end tests, 
it's very tempting to go in and do something, fix something, make them more reliable, for example, and then see, oh, it's failing again. Go in, fix something. I remember when I was a little kid, I used to, maybe a really little early memory, I liked having a helium balloon on a, on a string because it would, you know, you pull it down and it would pull back, and you pull it down and it would pull back. But, you know, maybe I wasn't at that point bright enough to realize I was self-activating, right? Literally pulling my own chain, right? And this happens, can happen, does happen. I've seen it a lot. I'll even present examples in end-to-end -end test code. If you see some grotesque error, and it's nice having our classification model that says, oh, wait, there was a runtime error there. Okay, yeah, maybe we should fix it. But if there's not something grotesque that's saying that you need to go back to that test or those tests that you tried to fix, the best thing you can do is stop, work on something else, and let the trend establish. This is a true screenshot from our system. This is the trend establishing itself. Here we see, okay, for this test, we clearly have a problem. We see where the pattern leads. This leads me to a little bit of an insect site uh, I had here in Numidal. Um, uh, if you go further up Numidal here, it gets the valley, turns into a Quite nice U-shaped, typical glacier valley. And um, there are many of these setterweg, uh, or pasture paths, all along uh, the road up uh, Numidal. And I've been exploring these a bit. Um, some of them are on the map, some of them are not on the map. And uh, a couple weeks ago, I was on this one, and I ended up where the GPS point is there. I actually followed a path that led to a derelict smashed shed from 100 years ago, uh, and it just stopped there. And I had started going downhill. Uh, this is very steep, so I just went, the path that's not shown is here, do, 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 do. And the thing that uh, was very tempting to, for me was to say, okay, I'll just go perpendicularly down the road. Um, very steep, very unpleasant terrain, very bushy, uh, but very, very human to say, I've got myself into the situation, I'll just improvise my, my way out of it. And I think this is where I got the insights about this, where I made the connection in my brain, that the best thing sometimes to do is maybe not think for, for a little bit, stop, you know, take a deep breath, think through this. I had to get a bus, right? So if I had started bashing my way down the hill and come to a steep uh, cliff, uh, I don't know if I would have injured myself or missed the bus or, right? So the best thing you can do is stop and think, how can I get out of this? It might require some effort. It might require going back uphill till I get to the path that is actually showing on the map and on my phone. Right? and then work my way down the hill without improvising, without sort of getting myself into a problem area and then pr trying to get myself out of it again. Uh, let me, uh, <laughs> so, but this is very, very inhuman. What we like to do is don't look up and just keep, keep bashing away. And it shows, this is code, uh, produced by my test automation team at uh, NEAT. Um, you can't really read it, and that's kind of the point, but there's a lot of ifs, there's a while loop, uh, ooh, there's a for. It's, it's basically somebody has got into an automation situation. Um, I, it doesn't look like you can really see the, uh, the git annotation back there, who that was. May have been several. Uh, got in a situation where they basically tried to program themselves out of a problem. And that probably happened repeatedly here. You see this is a diff. So, well, the function name seems to have gone further and the assert has gone further, uh, but that's it. And that's because it became this. And this is um, using a functional inspired uh, um, model. Um, where basically we have defined the set of steps that should get us down the mountain. 
the best candidates. And we came up with a little uh, function, which uh, we, uh, we, we decided to call Henrule. So I guess I might translate it to in English as to blunder blindly onward. And that's what it does. This Henrule goes through this list of functions that is given, in this case, three times. And the functions, they're pretty close to pure functions. They can't communicate with each other. So there's no chance of using an if to react to what the previous function did. Right? Uh, we debated with this with colleagues that, oh, maybe it should be kind of a real pipeline where at least you get something, a value from the previous function. And I thought, nah, I don't want to do that because we're just going to write ifs. And that's going to mess it up. And this has worked fantastically, and not just here. We've used it in a lot of places. And this, this kind of way of taking a step back, analyze what are, is the surefire way to get out of the situation. Um, so that's kind of my, another point I'd like to, like to tell you, make is, yeah, um, don't improvise your way down the mountain. Um, and uh, this brings me to auto-test frameworks. Uh, is anybody using a uh, robot framework? Anybody using behave? Oh, cool, okay, I, yeah, yeah. Um, End-to-end -end test frameworks have an interesting uh, advantage over unit test frameworks, which, despite the name, can be easily used for end-to-end -end tests. And that is that they are built for reuse. And when you think about it, things that have been tried and uh, tr tested before tend to work. Um, so this is kind of an unheralded quality of end-to-end -end tests, um, that they incorporate reuse, and so they therefore incorporate reliability. Let's look at the difference between uh, a very, very good unit test framework and compare that to an end-to-end -end test framework. Uh, this is Catch-2. I love Catch-2. I'm not uh, dissing Catch-2 at all. Um, you've got some closures, and you've got some code in a closure. right? That's basically a function. And this is a trivial example, but every function in the closure is unique for this test, right? So we have some given, and uh, so we initialize stuff. Then that's when the action happens, and then some uh, asserts. Yeah, we reuse an, uh, an assert library, just like we do an end-to-end -end test, but all this is absolutely linked to that specific little piece of code you're using. So it's all new. Um, and the problem is when you're using uh, unit test frameworks to do end-to-end -end testing, you're basing yourself a lot on things that are pretty much all new. Um, but look at this. This is Python behave. Uh, this is seen in something I've made that allows you to sort of see the test steps and the test step implementation function. And this is serious reuse because this is using a Gherkin. Gherkin is the given when then language convention scenario outline. So we can run through uh, a table of values. Uh, Catch2 has exactly the same thing. It looks a bit magic, it looks a little bit dodgy, but it's very inspired by this. You don't need to do this, but this I assert people count is X. And what are we doing? I told you, uh, I tell the kids I make our devices have bad dreams. We're giving it a bad dream. We're showing our audiovisual uh, video conferencing devices an image that it thinks is camera input, and then the algorithms, uh, machine learning algorithms that we have in there are picking out the people count. So that's what we're testing. So we're reusing this function here. And the thing is, we're reusing it in this test, but to bring it in any other uh, behave test, we just need to drop in a Gherkin keyword given when, then, but, I assert people count is. So we can reuse the same assert everywhere. It's not one off. This is a very, very cool way of uh, getting, you, getting you down the mountain. Um, I can just show you really fast since uh, people were interested. Robot, if you go to Robot Framework, you get a quite cool uh, 
thing here, which allows you to run robot in the browser. This is robot. Uh, it's got three parts. The top part is basically an extraction uh, layer that is based on function aliases. And you see pretty clearly that, okay, login user, that is a function call, and we're sending in Iron Man and da 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 da. Uh, I can run it. It takes a little time because it's uh, using um, WebAssembly, just like the next thing I'm going to show you. But uh, okay, and it's going to run green. Great. And I can mess it up by messing up uh, the password here. And it's going to run red. Yeah, it will. I don't really need to run it. Um, it's got three parts. It's got this uh, um, test suite, robot test suite. It's also got these resource files, and these resource files push reuse kind of in a cool way. That login user is actually built up of other existing steps. So it's the login user that actually is executing several other uh, steps. And so you can build up your tests out of reuse of parts. All right, so this is really good. And then it finally calls into uh, Python uh, code. And basically, uh, the, you use underscores. And so in the, in the test suite, you can just say set password without underscore and send in a password value right after that. And so, and that will invoke this code here. Um, thing I'm not so happy with ro with robot is that um, it uh, it doesn't have any explicit way of saying which functions in this file uh, you should be able to use or not. There's no explicit way to delegate to designate which functions you're going to use. They're all in. So I had an unhappy experience with the robot where it was actually invoking a function that was just in the Python imports for the module. Uh, and uh, I was getting a wrong kind of argument, really hard to figure out what was the problem. Um, Let's take a quick look at Python behave. Uh, this is actually a, uh, if you go to um, Python behave contrib, you'll find try behave. And this is my little contribution to trying to do uh, exactly the same thing as the runner is doing in uh, the robot framework. Um, so, and this is actually, I'm using a very much inspired by what's on the robot framework, because I thought, you know, people should be able to make a fair comparison between the two. Uh, so I can go ahead and uh, take away the how it works, so you see it. And I can mess up the password, save the file, and I can run the feature, and it's going to fail. Um, just uh, my experience is the function, again, we have an abstraction layer, which uh, is, uh, representing function calls, but it does it in a much more fluent way. Uh, if you see, uh, I create a user with name uh, right here, this one here, uh, that maps to, or that invokes this function here. And instead, in, instead of having to send the arguments afterward, the arguments are integrated in. And it actually can be very, very, very smart uh, the way it does it. Um, uh, one thing that's um, something that's, um, I showed you with robot how uh, um, how I um, how we build up uh, new um, test steps from existing test steps. So I thought I'd show you really quickly how you do that uh, uh, with behave. Behave actually only has two major moving parts. So it's got the feature file, this one right here, and it's got uh, the, actually I'll not do that yet, um, yeah, uh, and it's got the uh, Python code, but it has a very explicit way of saying which functions should be exposed. It has a decorator with a Gherkin keyword given when then. So I thought I'd uh, go ahead and uh, I just ended up on the wrong file. And I would take uh, the uh, take uh, the steps, uh, two steps from the Gherkin feature and make them into one and use them. I do a non-admin thing and uh, def uh, non-admin. 
uh, takes a context object, which is really handy. So all behave functions take a context object, and context has a um, a method, a function called execute uh, underscore steps, and we can just drop in the steps that we had there. like that. And I need two more. Yeah, looks good. So I'll go ahead and save that if nobody sees an issue with that. I'll copy the text here. This is using, as I said, WebAssembly in the browser. Okay, and if I go back to the feature website steps, there I can basically comment out uh, these two right here. And I can drop in when I do a non-admin thing. And I can save the file. And if life is fair and good, it pops up here. It's used here in this test. Uh, will run and uh, it fails because I messed up the password. But if I scroll down, you see uh, when I do a non-admin thing and it ran green. So that's just a little bit of a quick run through these tools. I think you, I really recommend using them. They're easy to learn. I've explained this, so I'm gonna skip over this. Um, so let's at this point wrap it up. Uh, let me give a summary of the talk this year. <laughs> um, you want failing end-to-end -end tests. You may be dreaming of the green day, but you know you have to realize that some of your dreams aren't healthy. Even if uh, they are true failing, uh, so um, true positive on a flaky basis because the system under test is flaky. It gives you valuable input for deciding what we're gonna fix now. Machine learning opens interesting horizons, but don't believe the hype. It's not the solution for everything. Working out the trends, I thought, oh, should we use machine learning? No, we can just use kind of a functional programming paradigm, which is perfectly well suited to this. Um, machine learning may be the perfect tool for solving shared knowledge problems. We have one of connecting test failures to known issues. Basically, when I get the scrubber role, I feel at the end of the week, I understand which failures should be connected to which known issues. Classic shared knowledge problem, machine learning. Everybody trains the model, right? And so it becomes the sum of everybody's knowledge. Probably the perfect solution for that. So I'm thinking that may be more successful. If you have enough end-to-end -end test tests to generate value, you also have problems dealing with uh, the chop. Remember that metaphor with uh, chop and seeing the long period important trends through the chops. You have to solve this to get value out of your end-to-end -end testing effort. We want to be valuable. We want to catch problems. Whatever you do, don't just react. Stop, take a breath, pull your head out of the steering and look up, slow down a bit. Let the trend establish itself before you act. Don't improvise, reuse the tool or the test step that has proven its works. Um, there's been uh, something about uh, you know, uh, slow tech. Um, Hannes Roland wrote this where he said, basically, right, we <laughs> pushing out uh, things all the time is terrible for people and uh, everything and they don't uh, get to broaden their personalities. I don't know about broadening personalities. Uh, this would be like uh, cursing in the church at NEAT because we churn out an amazing amount of new products. Uh, uh, so I don't know if I'm gonna get 100% behind this one. I have some understanding for it, but let me say what I've said is that sometimes slower is actually much faster when you stop and you figure out, well, what's going on? What's the trend? Or if you take a step back and figure out, okay, I've got a tricky automation problem. What is the way, what is the, what is the sequence of operations that should always get me out of this pickle? So slower, maybe faster, 
and more effective. And I'll uh, just close off with my wish to you. May all of your end-to-end -end tests be true. <laughs>